Good morning. Christ is risen. Happy Easter to everybody. We'd like to welcome uh, the Reverend Linda Faith Chop. She will be leading us in worship service this morning. Uh, a few announcements this morning. The first is uh, Denise has had a second surgery and uh, all is going well. We will keep her in our prayers and Clifford as well. Uh, there is a card available downstairs, so during coffee hour, it will be available so we can sign. Oh, it's actually, okay, in back of the sanctuary, so after service you can sign the card. And uh, in terms of other announcements, uh, there are memorial flowers here. Uh, just one correction, though, is uh, Reverend Linda Faith's mother's name. We're just going to correct it right here. In loving memory of Sophie. So thank you. So uh, thank you. We'll, I'll just say the names. Uh, so uh, these flowers have been given to the glory of God by Fuad Ajami, Betty Grant, Andreas Madrigal, and Cynthia Mina, Lara, Doug Mackey, Linda Faith Chalk, Beth Chittim, and Heather Reed. Uh, our special Easter offering, that's the yellow envelope in your envelope, Box. You might have seen it already. It's designated to CAP. That's CAP d'Action Biblique. Uh, you can actually visit their website. It's uh, www.cabqc.ca. It's a, it's a great place. Uh, uh, it's not too far from here if you'd like to go to summer camp uh, with your children or a place for children to go. So you can, for more details, visit uh, the website. And it's a very good ministry, and I've been there once. Uh, it was absolutely fantastic. They've got this little tiny church. Uh, it's very small, it's basically a cabin, and uh, we had a worship service there, and uh, it was amazing. So that was a few years ago, I'd like to go back. But a uh, very good place, and a great place for children. Let me just check out the other announcements. You know what? We have uh, two very special anthems this morning. So uh, Henry Cobb Howells will be leading music throughout the service, as per usual. But we've also got a trumpeter accompanying some of the piano music during the service, as you might have heard. So we'd like to welcome uh, Daniel Howells. Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> and we've got, uh, we'd like to thank our choir as well for the two special anthems. So uh, with that being said, let's worship our risen Lord.
Please be seated. And our prayer of adoration. God of resurrecting power, you lift our hearts with joy when we see the tomb is empty. God of resurrecting hope, you fill us with excitement when we hear that Christ is risen. God of resurrecting love, you embrace us with courage when we trust in the power of new life that you promise in the risen Christ. We offer you all glory, honor, and praise with hearts overflowing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And we join in the prayer of confession. God of resurrecting joy, we confess it's not easy to sustain Easter hope. We let discouragement, fear, and frustration settle in, and we let anger and anxiety turn our hearts away from you. Resentment and disappointment cling to us, and we forget your great mercy and love. Forgive us, restore within us the joy and hope you promise us in Christ our risen Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn us? Only Christ, and Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and set free for new life by God's re resurrecting grace. Let us join in the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught his disciples as we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now I invite the choir to come forward.
Good morning. Happy Easter. Okay. Oh, yes. Bonjour. Okay. So, three more. Good morning. Welcome all. Okay. So, here I have an Easter basket. Have any of you had an Easter egg hunt? No? Not yet? Not yet? Okay. So, I have this one. And this one. And this one. This one. And they're all different colors. And I just would like to use those eggs for a moment this morning to tell you a story. So, my Easter basket is ready. I was never ever part of an Easter egg hunt when I was a kid. But I did it for my nephews and my niece. That was fun. And I did it for children in the church. But I want to use those four eggs to tell you about that first Easter. Every single one of them is very, very special. And this first one, is special because there's a cross in it. And on Good Friday, we remember that Jesus died on the cross. So, the first egg reminds us that Jesus died for us. Now, he was willing to go to the cross for your sins and for mine because that is the only way that we could be friends with God. Now, this one has three nails because when Jesus went to the cross, he was nailed to the cross. Now, these ones aren't very big, and that's fine, but they represent the nails that Jesus had as he was nailed to the cross, his hands and his feet. So they're just little ones, but they remind us about his death on the cross. Now, the next one is a stone. And the stone reminds us that when Jesus' body was taken down from the cross, he was put into a tomb, and the stone was put in front of the entrance so that nobody could get in and nobody can get out. And the story of that first Easter is that when the women came to see him and wondered who was going to remove the stone, the stone was already removed because God had taken care of that by the angels. Now, this is the last egg. It's empty. It's empty because the tomb was empty because Jesus, by the power of God, was raised from the dead. He walked out of the tomb, and the empty egg reminds us that Jesus is alive. And we worship him as our risen Lord. And we celebrate his resurrection, particularly on Easter Sunday. So, I would like you to think about these things. And I would like to remind you that this is a very, very special 
time for us as Christians. Jesus willingly took up his cross, but he could not be held by the nails. He is risen because God raised him from the dead. And the Bible tells us that everyone who believes in him will join him in the Father's presence. So we're going to have a prayer, and then you're either going to go back to your families or you're going back because there are some sheets for you to work on as well. Okay. Loving God, we thank you for our youth and for our children today. And we thank you that this Easter is a special time when we remember the depth of your love and your care for us by sending Jesus to be our Lord and Savior. And we thank you that by your power, you raised him from the place of death to new life. And we celebrate his life in us. And we pray a blessing on our children and our youth. And we pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Okay. There you are. Thank you. We're going to sing again. I invite you to stand as you were able. Now the vault of heaven, let the vault of heaven resound. Please be seated.
prayer for understanding. Spirit of resurrecting truth, roll away any assumptions that block our understanding of the Easter story. Open our minds and hearts to receive the good news that Christ is risen indeed. Change our lives with this gift. Hallelujah. The responsive psalm is Psalm 118, verses 1 to 2, and then 14 to 24. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This lesson is taken from Acts chapter 10, verses 34 to 43. I'll be reading in French, but the English is on the screen. Pierre prit alors la parole. Maintenant, je comprends vraiment que Dieu n'avantage personne. Tout être humain dans le monde qui, connaît, qui reconnaît son autorité et qui fait ce qui est juste, lui, est agréable. Il a envoyé ce message au peuple d'Israël, la bonne nouvelle de la paix par Jésus-Christ, qui est le Seigneur de tous les êtres humains. Vous savez ce qui est arrivé d'abord à Galilée, puis dans toute la Judée, après que Jean a annoncé la bonne nouvelle et baptisé. Vous savez comment le Dieu a choisi Jésus de Nazareth pour son service et lui a accordé la puissance de l'Esprit Saint. Vous savez aussi comment Jésus a parcouru le pays en faisant le bien et en guérissant tout ce qui était sous le pouvoir du diable, car Dieu était avec lui. Et nous, nous sommes témoins de ce qu'il a fait dans le pays, des Juifs et à Jérusalem. On l'a fait mourir en le pendant au bois de la croix, mais Dieu l'a ressuscité le troisième jour. Il lui a donné d'apparaître, non à tout le peuple, mais à nous qui Dieu a choisi d'avance comme témoin. Nous avons mangé et bu avec lui, après Dieu l'a ressuscité d'entre les morts. Il nous a commandé d'annoncer la bonne nouvelle au peuple et d'attester qu'il est celui qui Dieu a établi pour juger les vivants et les morts. Toutes les prophètes ont témoigné à son propos en disant que toute personne qui croit en lui reçoit le pardon de tous ses péchés dans le pouvoir de son nom. The second lesson is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, 
in which you stand and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I have delivered to you as of first importance what I also receive, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. But I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Thanks be to God. The reading from Matthew's Gospel. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, mother, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Thus endeth the gospel lesson. <clears throat> Loving God, we thank you. We thank you today as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. We simply ask that you would teach us and bring to remembrance the depth of your love and your care for us. And we pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Here we are, Easter Sunday, 2024. Throughout the world where Jesus is worshipped and glorified, the cry rings out, the Lord is risen, he is risen indeed. We are here today because we want to celebrate the love of God and the wonder and glory of his grace. In a day and age where much wonder is lost and there is a communal hardness of heart, we are here because this event, which happened in a garden over 2,000 years ago, was witnessed by the women coming to the tomb. This is the central point of history for time and for eternity. At its precise moment, when God intervened to bring Jesus from the place of death to life, only God the Father and our Lord Jesus know what happened in the tomb. There is no human agency here. It was between God the Father and God the Son. We are witnesses to the results of that event, event by the witness of the Holy Spirit in the very depth of our being saying yes to God. Last year, I shared the story of the attempt of the former Communist Party in the former Soviet Union to silence those who proclaimed the resurrection as they responded en masse. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. There are still voices and ideologies which want to silence this great proclamation of the power of God over both life and death, 
the sad truth is that they are closer to us in society than we realize. There, are, there is a rising up within society of a spirit of darkness and death that seeks to stifle and kill this most important message of life. All four of the gospel writers tell of the passion, arrest, trial, and crucifixion and death of Jesus on the cross. There may be minor differences in the details because the details come to us from eyewitnesses. These same four Gospels tell us the story of Jesus' resurrection. Not how it happened, but that it happened. What happened in that tomb between the time that Jesus was laid there and the first Easter morning is between God the Father and God the Son who, when he died on the cross, took on all our sin, shame, sickness, and death. And each of the gospel writers includes some details which either have stuck with them, or they looked on and saw something that they wanted to include. Mark's story of the resurrection is the shortest. In reality, biblical scholars believe that the original ending of Mark's gospel has been lost in antiquity. And as we have the latter part of the gospel, of the ending of Mark's gospel, Tom Wright says, I suspect that the book concluded with Jesus not only confirming to them that he was alive again in a new, though thoroughly bodily way, but also commissioning them for the work that now awaited them. This ending may not have been very long, but it will have been important as the intended conclusion to the book. And this is from Mark for Everyone by Tom Wright. So what does Mark have to tell us about the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, on this Easter Sunday? Mark, in a manner somewhat unusual for him, gives, gives the women on their way to the tomb as Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome. And we're told that they came very early after the sunrise, possibly to avoid the Jews. The topic of their conversation was who would be able to move the stone. They could not possibly do the work of anointing unless they could enter the tomb. A huge boulder would make that impossible for them. But as they continue to the tomb, they see that the stone has been rolled back and were told that it was very large. What is interesting in all four gospel accounts of the resurrection is that the first witnesses to the resurrection were women. In the ancient world and in Judaism, the word of a woman was not considered reliable. In fact, if it were not for the presence of the women at the tomb in all of the gospel accounts of the, early, of the resurrection, um, the early church would not have placed them there. But they were there. In God's economy, their witness, while excluded in human society, is included in divine society. The stone has been rolled away, another sign of God at work, and their problem has been resolved in a manner which they had never, ever considered. In Mark's gospel, the removing of the stone bears witness to the reality that the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ was entirely the work and agency of God the Father. Therefore, the human role in this event was as witness, not as worker. They enter, enter into the tomb and there encounter another surprise. The body of Jesus is not there, but an angel is there to tell them the good news and to give them the instructions as to what to tell the disciples. These women are confronted with surprise after surprise after surprise. How do they cope? They take it all in, the stone rolled away, the absence of the body of Jesus, the angel's message. They take it all in, and they run back home, and they don't tell anybody. They're scared, speechless. The witness they are to take to the disciples is still within them. They are silent. Have you ever had the experience of seeing something happen, and you're trying to articulate what you're seeing, but the words just won't come? It's really alarming. I was staying with friends, and at supper, as I looked out the window, the neighbor's house behind them caught fire. And it happened so fast 
and I'm sitting at the dining room table trying to say fire, and the word won't come. And finally, as I'm pointing, they turn around, they look, and they see the fire. The truth is that Mark leaves us in a bit of a puzzle. The angel gives the women instructions as to who to tell and what to do, but then Mark reminds us that they fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. When are we afraid to speak? Why are we afraid to speak? Or of what are we afraid to speak? When? If something reflects badly on us, we wouldn't want to draw attention, negative attention to ourselves, and so we remain silent. Why? Because we don't want people to think badly of us. We do have to admit the truth that there are times that we're afraid to declare the truth. In our day and age, the church is thought ineffectual and outdated. There's a hubris in society that basically prides itself on knowing better. The women at the tomb had the greatest news in the world. The tomb was empty. Jesus had been risen from the dead, and they did not know what to do with it. The central event of the Christian gospel, the power of God reaching into that place of death and raising our Lord to life, he walked out of that tomb in the power of the resurrection. And it is this power that continues to call us to himself. It is this central truth that should make us excited to want to run out and tell others, to share the good news that Jesus is risen from the dead. How does the resurrection impact our lives? Well, perhaps that may be a dangerous question to ask if you look at the average church in North America. It seems to have little impact, and some people who have sat in church pews for years might even feel bored. Why? Because their hearts and minds and wills have never been touched by the spirit of wonder of God at work. God, the Lord of heaven and earth, reached into that place of death and by his mighty arm raised Jesus from the dead. The truth is that Jesus is risen. Our other readings for this service speak of the other witnesses, those who were not at the tomb with the women, but by meeting Jesus, they became witnesses of his resurrection. Can we even begin to imagine? The practical and mundane question they considered on their route, who would remove the stone that they might enter? Yes, they were strong women, capable of water pots and life. They were part of their daily routine, but tombstones were a little out of their league. You sometimes note that we skate around the lesser stuff in order to avoid the heavier, weighted things. They are speaking of moving the stone. Their minds have gone to the fact that their Lord was in the tomb. God had a surprise for them. In reality, a series of surprises. First, the stone was rolled away, which raised a question, rather than who did it. Perhaps the question took the lines of, what's going on? They approach the open tomb, where a further surprise greets them. There's the presence of an angel, and he's rather chatty. He has news for them. He shows them that Jesus is not there. They can see that, but he gives them further instructions. Jesus has gone ahead of them, and they are to tell the disciples. They, the women, are preoccupied with death. Jesus is preoccupied with life. The response to that which they have seen and have been told is not one of faith, but rather one of fear. The delicious irony of the resurrection was that it was completely unexpected, Jesus had told them, he had given them signs and teaching, but because it was so foreign to their experience and expectations, they couldn't deal with what he was telling them. The most stupendous news of the move of God in human history, and the women were afraid and went home. Paul cites the number of witnesses, post-resurrection appearances of our Lord, so that these two were eyewitnesses to the resurrection. We were not there, we did not see him in the flesh, but the, by the eyes of faith, we're permitted to see the power of the resurrection in our lives by the gracious working of God's Holy Spirit. 
poor women, rather than following the angel's instruction to go and tell, they are so stunned by this incredulous truth that they say nothing. Their silence lends its own authenticity to the proof of the resurrection. If they are just hysterical women fantasizing out of frustration, why do they not talk? Anyone who has stood in the presence of God loses the glibness of a smooth and ready tongue. Trembling hands, whirling mind, and faltering heart. These are all the after effects of meeting God face to face. Fear so ties their tongues that Jesus will have to confirm the fact of his resurrection by personal appearances rather than by spoken word. There was a young military widow living in Washington, D.C. She had been married four months and her husband was killed in an accident. And after his death, she felt more dead than alive and she struggled. And people were concerned for her. That year, when Easter Sunday came along, a friend asked the young widow to go to church with her. It just so happened that this was the time when Peter Marshall, uh, the legendary Peter Marshall, was the minister of the Presbyterian Church in downtown Washington. And that morning, Peter Marshall spoke of Mary coming to the tomb and how her tears had turned to joy. He described the sound of a wind rustling through the tomb as if the breath of God were blowing by. He described the sight of Jesus rising from that cold slab, swaying a bit on wounded feet and then walking into the garden. He described the smell, the whiff of strange scents which must have drifted back to the man from that tomb. The smell of linen and spices and bandages, myrrh, close air, and blood. This is from his sermon, The First Easter. By the time that Peter Marshall had finished the sermon, the people in that church felt as if they were in the garden to witness that first Easter themselves. And when the service was over, the young woman practically walked on air as she left the church. And her friend couldn't believe the change which had come over her. What happened to you in there, she asked. The weight has finally been lifted, the young woman replied. Now I can go on living again. The central fact of the Christian faith is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Had it all ended on the cross, there would have been no good news to share, no bold church to bear witness, no New Testament to teach and preach, no hope for real life or in the here or in the hereafter. It is life here or in the hereafter. It's impossible to overestimate the importance of the resurrection to our lives. Paul dwells on the fact that resurrection actually took place. And Paul summarizes God's activity in three statements. Christ died for our sins, was buried, and he rose again. And this was basically an early confession from the early believers at the time of their baptism. Paul, in a very condensed form, focuses on the significance of the, significance of the cross in salvation, the reality of Jesus' death on our behalf, and our hope in the resurrection but his reminding them of what the gospel was and what it meant for their lives was leading up to the main point of the chapter, that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was an event that really took place in temporal time, and its implications are enormous, world-changing and life-changing. Paul reminded them that when the gospel is reduced to its essence, it is an event in history no room for wokeism here, no rewriting of history. It stands the test of time for all eternity. As the Apostle Peter gives his defense in the book of Acts, he clearly states, this Jesus God raised up, this Jesus God raised up by the power of God, Jesus was brought forth from the place of death. His was a resurrection which defeated the power of sin and death. 
Three fundamental lines of evidence intertwine to convince us that Jesus rose from the dead. The fact of the empty tomb, the testimony of numerous eyewitnesses, and the long-term impact of the lives of Jesus' followers. Jesus had risen just as he told them he would. Philip Brooks' short poem illustrates this. Tomb thou shalt no longer hold him. Death is strong, but life is stronger. Stronger than the dark, the light. Stronger than the wrong, the right. Faith and hope triumphant say, Christ will rise on Easter day. I speak to him in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite the choir to come forward. I invite you to stand as you are able. And let us confess our faith as we use the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We are going to sing, He is Lord. And the second verse is in French. Easter Day celebrates God's most precious gift to us in Christ dying and his rising. As we present our gifts this morning, may our generosity reflect God's goodness to us and the hope we have in Christ Jesus, our risen Lord. God of resurrecting grace, we offer our gifts with grateful hearts, recognizing how much you have given us in Christ and what that gift has cost. Empower these gifts to spread the hope and joy we feel today in the world you love. In the name of your greatest gift, Jesus Christ. Amen. Continuing on in prayer. Oh. Prayer. God of new beginnings, break into your church with resurrecting power. 
where congregations are challenged to rethink outreach in changing times, inspire new approaches and renew commitment for today's ministry. Where gathering resources and finding new leaders present challenges, renew our trust in your faithfulness and our hope that remembers the empty tomb. Resurrect, renew, and revive your people, O oh God. God of new possibilities, break into our relationships with resurrecting power. Where they are vibrant and life-giving, nurture and sustain them. Where there are memories of hurt or current misunderstanding, refresh them with forgiveness and reconciliation. Where they are neglected or taken for granted, open our eyes to the great gift we offer each other. Resurrect, renew, and revive your people, O oh God. God of new opportunity, break into the governance of your world with resurrecting power. Stir the minds and hearts of leaders to work for justice and the equitable sharing of resources. Where violence and conflict threaten the innocent and the earth itself, raise up advocates for peace and negotiators to call combatants to account. Bring wisdom, compassion, and cooperation to all in authority. Resurrect, renew, and revive your people, O God. God of new life, break into situations of illness, pain, grief, and loss with resurrecting power. Where there is sickness of body, mind, or spirit, bring healing and hope. And we pause to remember today Julie and Denise and Karen. And we ask the Lord that you would continue to bring healing to them, body, soul, and spirit. Where people mourn the loss of someone dear or their dreams of a better tomorrow, bring comfort and courage to go on. Resurrect, renew, and revive your people, O oh God. God of new creation, break into the circumstances, places, and lives that we name in the silence of our hearts. And we pause to remember those who have family visiting at this joyful Easter time. And we ask for a great visit and great family time. Resurrect, renew, and revive your people. God of Easter Day, break into our moments of celebration and joy. Give us gratitude, the impulse to share, and a spirit of grace and understanding. Resurrect, renew, and revive our spirits. Hear our prayer. Amen. I invite you as you are able to stand, and our final hymn this morning is Thine Be the Glory.
to amaze you with Mary's joy in the garden to lift your hearts, and the disciples' hope at news Jesus has risen to encourage you. And may God's resurrecting love open the future for you, empowered by the Spirit and embraced by Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen.